All right, well, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Park Ranger Jim Hollister from Minuteman National Historical Park, and I am very pleased to be joined uh, today by uh, archaeologist Dr. Meg Wilkes and historian Joel Boy, and we're going to be talking about uh, discovering Lexington's lost battlefield. So back in, uh, what was it, 2013 that uh, this whole process began? Yeah. Yeah, 2013 to 2016, there was a major investigation at Minuteman National Historical Park to locate the site of a very important uh, battle site um, that happened within the boundaries of Minuteman National Historical Park. And uh, it's called Parker's Revenge. And uh, Joel, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is meant by Parker's Revenge and why is this battle site so important? Well, you know, over the years, um, people tend to try to find names to kind of put on some of these places, whether it's Bloody Angle or Parker's Revenge. And Parker's Revenge seems to be one of those terms that came up in the uh, early 20th century. Um, and I guess it, it does fit in a way, but um, you know, it's the spot where after the horrific incident on the green in the morning, mm -hmm. Lexington finally you know, got their, their unit together formed up, marched out of town to find the British column and found a place to wait and, uh, and as people say today, exact their revenge, although, you know, they were doing just what everybody else was doing. So who was, who was Parker? Well, Captain John Parker is the uh, commander of the Lexington Militia Company. Mm -hmm. um, he's, uh, he's a regular guy like, like most of the others in town. He's, he's got his, you know, his daily duties, but he's also captain of the militia. Um, he had been in the militia for a long time. Um, there are some mistaken um, quotes that he was, you know, he fought in the French and Indian War, which we've gone through the records at Mass Archives. He didn't fight through the French and Indian War. However, um, he was in the militia at that time and had been doing his civic duty. So he, he was commander of the, uh, the Lexington Militia Company and he brings them out. So why is this particular battle site so important? Well, you know, again, we've got to go back to what happened to Lexington in the morning. Um, you know, the, the, the British Smiths column marches out. Um, they find um, the Lexington militia who had been alarmed earlier and who formed up on the common. Um, and, you know, we all know what happened. Eight men killed, 10 wounded. Um, devastating for Lexington. You know, mm -hmm. brothers, cousins um, slaughtered on the common. And then the British march off. Uh, the regulars march off to Concord to perform their task of destroying stores, leaving Lexington with with a, a total mess. Um, you know, so the fact that they were able to form up to me and to march out to a spot and find a great position to fire at the column says a lot about Parker and his men uh, for what they did that day. Certainly, I mean, being willing to go back into the fight. Uh, you know, after just being swept off the oh, field. Exactly, exactly. It's just yeah. devastating. You know, easily one of the most, uh, you know, inspiring stories in a day full of, of inspiring stories and, and bravery. Very true. Very so, true. So as I understand, there was some debate and, and considerable uncertainty uh, over the location of this battle site, you know. However, since like late 19th century uh, and into the late 20th century, really, uh, historians had pretty well settled on that rocky outcrop. There's a, a, a rocky outcrop is the battle road is heading um, heading east. You know, it takes a takes a dip to the to the south, and right at that turn, just beyond um, Nelson Bridge, you know, there's this rocky outcrop, and it commands the road. And I remember, you know, in my early years of my career, um, you know, taking tours. And that was it. That was the site of Parker's Revenge. And we'd take people up there and say, you know, they were firing down on the column from here. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, some very well-respected historians and even some with vast military right. experience, General John Galvin, um, who was the Supreme NATO commander in Europe, said, this is where it happened. I mean, the, and the site does have a lot of uh, things to recommend it. but um, no, nope, kitty, kitty coming in here. Um, does have a lot of things to recommend it, but we still couldn't be certain um, that that's where the battle took place. So, you know, why did we have to go and look? You know, why couldn't we just say that's where it was? That's it. 
Well, one of the one of the things, you know, I've I've been going out to that site. I read Galvin as a as a kid, mm. um, going out to that site numerous numerous times, you know. And at first, I I, I believed it, um, but then as you start to learn more about tactics um, and access egress, you know, you walk up on that rocky outcrop and it's it's really a horrible place mm. um you're right out by the road um there's a great slope down on on the uh on on both sides of it actually but one on the on the on the lexington side <clears throat> and it's just a really when you look at it it just doesn't make sense mm. so yeah so that i mean that raises questions uh, obviously um now, normally, when we're trying to locate a battle site, um, you know, we want to, you know, we go to the historical records and things like that, but they were uh, rather lacking uh, in this battle. I mean, you know, there was the account from Nathan Monroe saying it was in the bounds of Lincoln. Okay. Um, so, obviously, you know, if the historical record, record fails us, you know, we have to look to, uh, to other methods. So, Meg, um, you were brought in uh, by the Friends of Minuteman National Park. Um, to uh, lead an archaeological investigation, which uh, just makes a lot of sense, you know, where the historical record is silent, you, you have to, you know, you have to use other methods. And, um, and and by the way, I think bringing you in as the project archaeologist was one of the best decisions uh, that uh, has ever been made. Um, Thank you. Sure. And um, mm -hmm. so can you talk us through how you approach this investigation in terms of, you know, your method, like the process? Of of unpicking this site and um, and and hopefully you know arriving at some sort of um, you know conclusions. Sure. Well, you know, as an archaeologist, we we look for evidence. So I'm looking for the actual artifacts and and uh, evidence of the battle or of a time period where people were working or or uh, inhabiting a landscape. So as an archeologist, we work in a very scientific method and we've many tools in our toolkit. So, you know, archeologists excavate. That's mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that we're very well known for. But we also, we review all of the documentation, the historical documentation. We, and this is all part of, so this, I, basically I'll take you through the process of the background research for the project um, that I undertook. And I, I didn't undertake it uh, on my own or in isolation, but we had a wonderful um, partnership with the park, with the Friends of the Park, with the Northeast Region Archaeology Program of the National Park Service, as well as with a dedicated group of very talented and, and knowledgeable um, volunteers, of which one um, Joel Bowie was, um, who's talking with us today. And I really counted on the volunteers in particular, and you, of course, Jim, but the volunteers had just a whole bunch of different information and and even some different opinions on on what went on. So that was all, and everyone, include you know, from the volunteers and everyone else I spoke with about the project, felt very free to to express their opinion of what happened at Parker's Revenge and where it happened. So it's really interesting coming in and saying, okay, we've got all of this information, but we don't actually know hmm. where this battle took place. So as an archaeologist. I say, let's go and see if we can find evidence, you know, if we can find musket balls, if mm -hmm. we can find pieces of uniforms that may have come off during that battle or tack from a horse, you know, something like that in the landscape. And then we look to see how those artifacts are arranged, where we find them and what order they're in. But before we actually go out and do that, and I think it was almost a whole year of background research mm. before we actually started digging into the ground, um, and what we did is build a historic 1775 landscape recreation. Mm -hmm. So we have today, as you walk out to the site, you can see the conditions. There's wetland out there. Um, and, and in April, if you think about, you know, the conditions we have now, if there'd been snow with the ice melt, it's really saturated now and wet and very gloppy in places. Mm. You know, and initially you'd think, oh, that's not good for a battle. That would stop a column of people or slow people down if they're right. going through all this mud and, you know, trying to get through things. But was that there in 1775? So, you know, that was one of the things we did. We worked with Richard Foreman. 
um, from Harvard University who uh, does that kind of research on historic, you know, recreating historic environments. Mm -hmm. We did research with a bunch of different people from the area, academics and volunteers, and, and, and really began to build up not just the environment, but what structures would have been there. So when we start talking about environment, we talk about structures. There's actually an assessment that we do called COCOA, that's the acronym, for mm -hmm. battlefield assessments. We're looking for areas of um, uh, lines of sight. We're looking, you know, like if you had a gun and you were looking to shoot at someone, where would you position yourself so that you could see them coming? Right. Um, you would also look for signs of cover. You know, was there a fence or a wall or a ditch or a building? So that's why d developing, um, you know, recreation of this landscape was so important. And in doing that, we used our archaeological toolkit. So first we did document research and I went and I found old aerial photographs from the 1930s, you know, like pre um, suburban development and, yeah. and vestiges of that old historic landscape. Um, and we looked at LIDAR, which is laser scan image from, from an airplane that had been collected, but we also had a team come out and collect ground-based, very high resolution laser scan data to get a really great three-dimensional model of what we felt was the core battlefield. Mm. Um, we did geophysical surveys, which we uh, helped identify where structures were mm -hmm. um, and where structures weren't um, on the landscape, which is also very important. And we did some excavations and, and located the, the corner of the Thomas Nelson Sr. or Tabitha Nelson's home mm -hmm. that was actually there on the day of the battle itself. And it was really great to put that down on the ground. It had been excavated in the 1970s, mm -hmm. but it had never been mapped. Um, sufficiently in the report right. or in the landscape. So that was, you know, kind of one of the big challenges of the project was to relocate that, pin it down and use that as one of, you know, the bases for this landscape and battlefield assessment. So once we, once we kind of developed this, this um, model, we, we looked at it because we had, an, we had an area of about 75 acres we were investigating and that's a large area. So first you need to narrow down your area that you're going to, you know, go dig in or go look for artifacts. You need to be smart about it. So we built all of this up. And, and by looking at that landscape, we decided on the core area of, of, our, of our survey, of our investigation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, at that time, we, I, I had monthly meetings um, with the park uh, superintendent, Nancy Nelson at the time, and Bob Morris, who was the head of the Friends, and Jim Kendrick, who was uh, at that point the regional archeologist of uh, the park service in, in our area. And I, I said to them, you know, we're doing this kind of work. We, we really should be doing metal detecting surveys or metallic surveys as we called them. And, and I said, you know, I really would like to work with this team of volunteers who's been helping. One, they're super knowledgeable. And I said, two, they're really not going to cost the project much, maybe just lunch and some, you know, some Cokes, you know, during, during our, our field work. Um, but, but more so to, you know, kind of one of my takeaways from the project was being able to work with the volunteers, mm -hmm. made this a project that was even more special than going out and, and finding and discovering great things. You know, I made very good friends, but they're the ones who were able to actually do the work every single step of the way um, and, and support me in, in pulling the whole effort together. So um, I, at, the, at one of our meetings, I, I proposed doing metallic surveys. Um, and I said, let's bring in some of the world leaders in metal detecting survey and archeology. span So mm. once everyone was in, in agreement um, of the team that would actually do the work and how they would be trained, um, we brought in Doug Scott, um, who's a lead battlefield and conflict archeologist mm -hmm. today. Um, he, if people are familiar with his name, you'll know that he did uh, some great work at the Battle of Little Bighorn, mm -hmm. um, some of the very first metal detecting work in an archeological scientific way where we yeah. lay out our grids, we cover full areas, and we record every artifact and every, every hit that we get in the ground. Um, so that was our next step after doing all the background research, after doing some excavations and identifying what was on the landscape and what wasn't. 
um, targeting a smaller area of about, I think it was 11 acres in the mm -hmm. end that, that, we, that we went for. We established a whole survey grid across the area. When I say survey grid, we had posts every 50 meters mm -hmm. across the site. So what's that? That's about 150 feet right mm -hmm. and then in that we we set out 20 meter or 60 foot grids all right and then we the way we began when we were first training was with we put survey lines out along those grids and and our volunteers and um we worked with pal which is the public archaeology lab from rhode island um, we subcontracted with them to take care of all the archaeological details so helping the volunteers also learn about what we do when we find an artifact. We don't just find it and put it in a bag and put it away, but we fill in forms and there's a certain way of processing things. Mm. Um, and together, uh, we all went across that landscape and, you know, Joel uh, can, can speak to the excitement as well as you, Jim. You came out and did some work with us of, of actually, you know, finding some of those first musket balls. And then, you know, kind of going around and, and, and mapping the evidence, the artifacts that told the story of the Parker's Revenge battle. Wow. So, I mean, you know, just how involved this is, uh, obviously, you know, for a lot of Park Service folks and, you know, uh, anyone who cares for historic places and battlefields, you say metal detecting, all of a sudden, shoom, wall comes down. Um, you know, or volunteers metal detecting and yes. alarm bells go off. Um, but I mean, obviously this is approached scientifically um, and those volunteers are very carefully chosen, mm -hmm. um, you know, as people with, with vested interest who share our mission, um, you know, so, you know, definitely like, so somebody going out with a metal detector, you know, finds a musket ball, picks it up, walks away, you know, do we learn anything from that musket ball? No, no. Yeah. no. And that, that's what, um, I, you know, we, I don't want, I didn't want to go too far. Cause I, when I start talking about Parker's revenge, my hands start moving and I'm bouncing, <laughs> I get excited, you know, and I could I could go on forever. Um, but you know, we, uh, Jim and you and I, Jim put together, um, the military tactical review event, mm. um, which, which you and, and, and Joel might want to talk about a little bit, but but what's so important is when we when we find our, our musket balls and when we find our evidence, and even not musket balls, anything, we're not just mm -hmm. looking at one time period. We found pre-contact artifacts as well during this whole investigation that, that are recorded and, and curated. But we map everything. So we so we know exactly where everything came out of the ground. And by having those patterns. And having that landscape reconstruction and thinking about cocoa and thinking about how people and, and how military tactics are engaged in a landscape, that's how having the evidence that's found through archaeological methodology really began to shine in this project. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So that's why if you, you go, you take a musket ball out of the ground, you walk away, you've essentially destroyed Oh, evidence. absolutely. Context is lost. Piece of evidence away. And it and it really it means, you know, nothing. It it has no value anymore, other than a bit of lead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And and you know, and you mentioned finding pre-contact. It's and this is one of the most things uh, things that I find amazing about the project is that you're looking for essentially, you know, in a landscape that's been inhabited by people for thousands of years, you're mm -hmm. looking for five minutes, <laughs> and you're able to find yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, speaking of those five minutes, so Joel, you were recruited uh, as one of those volunteers to assist uh, with the um, metallic surveys. So, you know, you're out there in the woods, you know, and you're getting ticks and poison ivy. Um, but what was it like when you found like that, that first musket ball from April 19th, 1775? Well, you know, when, when the project, again, this went on for a, new, a number of weeks um, over a few year period, um, the first few weeks, I didn't find anything because everybody had their jobs. Um, Meg would have, you know, people doing specific things. Um, so other team members were finding things, which was extremely exciting, even though I wasn't the one um, oh, yeah. during the first few weeks that was finding any. Uh, but again, it's, it's a team effort. It's not just about one person digging right. something out of the ground. Everybody's doing their job. Um, exactly. You know, Meg would say, you need to go here and do this, and we'd do it. And uh, that was, you Mostly. know, whether if you find, right, if you find nothing there, that's, that's data also. 
Right. Um, so we all had tasks to do over that over the three weeks we worked in the field. Um, now I do have to say that on the last week, um, in the middle of the week, um, we were getting a little tired, mm -hmm. um, and Meg and Doug Scott and I sat down for a minute, um, and uh, Meg came over and said, "Come on, guys, let's let's get back to work." And all of a sudden, we started to find mm -hmm. a line of provincial um, fowler ball and some larger boar could be fowler also. Um, like I said, in a line. Um, and one after the other. And it was extremely exciting. I mean, the hair stands up on the back of my neck today just talking about it. Mm. Um, because, you know, Meg would put the, we put the fine, we'd, we'd bag it, tag it, um, and put the flag there to record it. And you turn around and look at the, the line that went, you know, through the woods. And it was like, holy crap. <laughs> you know, this is a story right here in numerous ways, because yes, it's telling us um, where people were, but it's also for me as a historian and material culture historian, I'm looking at these ball and measuring them and we're finding out, you know, okay, this is the type of guns that they're carrying. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was extremely exciting. It, yeah. And, and I similarly remember walking on site when one had just come out of the ground and I think Meg, you put it in my hand and uh, just, you know, years of studying this and here's like something tangible from the battle. And, uh, right. you know, it's just an incredible. So all in all, how many musket balls were recovered from the site? <laughs> I think it was in the end, we recovered 29. Mm hmm. And uh, Barbara Donahue, who is an archaeologist who did work on the Hanscom base that's adjacent to the Parker's Revenge battlefield, basically, in the Minuteman Park, she had found three a number of years previously. But it wasn't, she, her, the end of her report said, I think we may have found, you know, something very exciting, but by including her research and all of her background work, she actually came out to site and worked with us um, for a day or so, you know, including all of that in, we had a total of 32 musket balls um, that, that we actually located. And certainly it's not all um, that are out there. There's still more out there. And it's quite possible that, you know, there are musket balls that just don't exist anymore, right? That came up in plowing or construction. There were two buildings, two houses with garages and all sorts of little outbuildings, sheds and things, kind of right there at the battlefield site. So there's a lot going on in that area. So, it, it, you know, again, all to, to leading to this amazing, like, you know, that it is a disturbed landscape and you're still able to, uh, to, to make these discoveries, all this evidence. So now we have evidence. We have musket balls. We have, you know, the, the LIDAR scans of the landscape, um, you know, key features, you know, like, talking about Kakoa, you know, so key terrain, um, obstacles, um, cover and concealment, um, observation fields of fire, and avenues of approach and retreat. There we go. Um, Yay! Hey. I never remember the whole thing. I know. It's like, I thought they were supposed to make it easy for people to remember. Um, so, you know, so you have like, you know, you, you have the landscape, you know, you've got the uh, aerial photos and, and, and identifying, you know, natural versus built uh, mm -hmm. features. Um, and, and of course, now the evidence that's come out of the ground. So um, putting it all together, they have to be analyzed, you know, so can we talk a little bit about the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the analysis, you know, what did we learn? Absolutely. I'll, I'll start and then I'll pass it on to you, Joel. So we've, we completed our final week of um, metal detecting survey and on a, I think it was a Friday. Uh, in fact, I think it was November 5th, Friday. It was my birthday. And um, the next midweek, the next week, we were having this great big 25 people invited military tactical event to actually interpret what happened um, during that period. And so I was trying to finish processing and mapping all of our find spots. So I'm working with computer software and with GPS data and all sorts of different information, trying to pull that all together. And meanwhile, Joel um, Bowie and Bill Rose and Bill Poole and Ed Hurley were working with you and with Doug Scott, who was with us again, on actually analyzing those musket balls that we mm. actually brought out of the ground. So, Joel, um, do you want to talk about that analysis? Did we lose Joel? 
Oh my God, we lost Joel. I think Joel might have, <coughs> excuse me, dropped out. Uh, let, see if I can get him again. Okay. Oh dear. I used his name one too many times. <laughs> so it's a no Joel for you. Exactly. Joel. All right, so hopefully he'll pop back on in a moment. Um, so, all right, so you, you were saying, so we did the, the tactical review. Yeah. Um, so we had, and I remember that day, that was uh, actually those two days. Oh, Joel's back. All right, Joel's coming back. I mean, it Here was- you go, uh, Joel. All right, we all sorted? I think I'm back. Okay. Great. Do you, wanna, do you wanna talk about the work that you guys did over the weekend with the musket ball um, interpretation? Uh, the study that we did with Doug. Yeah. Um, yes. like, yeah. 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 So what we were able to do was sit down with each musket ball that was found um, during the whole project. And we recorded the weight. Um, we recorded the size. Um, and we also um, kind of got all that information together so we could try and identify um, what types of ball they were, what types of guns they came out of. Um, so that Meg could plot that. Um, when she got that data, she could put it all um, in the computer so that we could see the different types of calibers and where the things were found, mm -hmm. um, which was extremely important to tell, tell the story when we finally had that meeting with everybody where we all got together and Meg shared yeah. the data and you could all see it on the big screen and you could see all those musket balls um, separated by, you know, British 69 caliber balls and by provincial ball and some unidentified because we don't know, um, some were highly deformed, some were not. Um, but, you know, it, it, it really gave us an idea of what happened there, which yeah. was incredible that day. So what's, what Joel is talking about is, you know, based on the weight, right? That's the caliber, the weight, right. size yeah. of the ball. Um, we can, as Joel said, learn about what weapons would have been used to fire those musket balls. And we know generally what weapons were being used by the British column and by the uh, the colonists. So I I just I was like I don't I don't need the details right now. This is right before you know everyone was coming in, and I had to produce maps that we could use for this this interpretation. And uh, I said I just need to know is it fired or dropped, and is it British or colonial, or unknown. And because I had, so I had all my data, all the fine spots were all mapped out in the landscape. I had all the fine spots and I thought, oh, geez, I, gosh, I hope it all falls into place because they knew what the balls were and how they, you know, what number count we had for things, but we didn't actually know where they were located. Mm. So what Joel just said is when I, for the first time, you know, kind of pulled that spreadsheet in with all of that information, British fired, colonial fired, and pulled it up, it that was it, right, Joel? That was just like, that was the story. Okay. There, there it is. Yeah, the, the you patterning know. was right there. It hmm. was right there on the map. Yeah, so, and, when, and even like when you read the report, what I, what I wrote with help of, of, of all of you guys actually, was you know, the alignment, the spacing between the musket balls that were the, the colonists fired, right? Lexington militia fired musket balls aligned with what we interpreted was actually people in deployment because of the spacing so I, and we'll get into that with with the the um in, interpretation we did in the field um with with the whole gang but that to me it was amazing that it wasn't just like oh here it is british fire colonial fired look they fired at each other here it is but we actually were able to dig into the tactics of engagement and that to me was so exciting. I had never thought we'd be able to do that. So if we went into this thinking or hoping that it was on that big rocky outcrop, mm -hmm. how did our interpretation of Parker's Revenge change as a result of this investigation? Do you want to well, do it that, Joel? Sure. It, <laughs> it changed completely. I, yeah. mean, I remember... I remember that first, at the, at the end of the first week, um, I went out there with you, Jim, mm. and all I did was show you where we didn't find things, and I showed <laughs> you where we did find things, and I was totally, okay, it was just here and here, nothing here, and I watched you look around 
at the landscape and it hit you. You, you knew that was the spot based upon uh, the landscape and what we had found. It just, it made sense at that point. Mm. Um, based upon where these people were, their access, egress, it was incredible. I remember the, I still remember the look on your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just remember the feeling. So we got the rocky outcrop, and actually it was on a, um, a ridge, uh, as you're looking at it, to the, to the left of it. I think it's running, what is it, running northeast, roughly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that ridge, boulders along mm -hmm. it, you know, the glacial erratics. It was a woodlot at the time, and... Whereas the hill, the, the rocky outcrop would have been a death trap, here they can get out much easier and still do pretty much the same amount of damage, you know, on the column. Yeah. Which, you know, to me thinking about this, like, you know, and Joel, to your point about just the courage of this company after being swept from the field to come back and, you know, come back together and go out back into the fight. You know, just extraordinary courage. But there's another lesson, a, a, a takeaway that, you know, it, it's sort of like Captain Parker, you know, you know, being validated, you know, vindicated, like he wasn't going to be careless with their lives. Mm. Um, you know, that here is a place where he can get, he can not only get them into the fight, he can get them out. Um, it, it, right. it was just. Right. And he could. He could move on to the next spot very exactly. easily from there, mm -hmm. you know, along that ridge to the bluff was mm -hmm. perfect, you know, perfect yeah, it, escape. It just checked all the boxes. And yeah, I remember the, the, um, the tactical review, the military analysis, you know, two days on site and having those finds mapped, mm -hmm. you know, the artifacts don't have opinions, you know, yeah. uh, people have yeah. opinions. <laughs> it's our job to hopefully form those opin opinions yeah. based on evidence um it just in, incredible so what were um what were some of the 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 takeaway lessons from this project in the big picture well for That's me amazing. um one of the big things is um archaeology and archaeological methods have a significant place in battlefield archaeology and they have a significant place in in places that we may know the history of, um, but may not have evidence that backs that up. And, and for me, that's, that's the big takeaway is, is really, as an archeologist, of course, <laughs> right. you know, find, find the evidence, the evidence contributes to that larger story. Yes, and, and you know, and how has the success of this project, you know, influenced other investigations, Joel, Meg, either of you? Oh. Go on, Yeah, Joel. That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, the Parker's Revenge project, you know, we finished the uh, project itself. We, you know, you guys did the interpretation, um, which was extremely important. But out of this project have uh, bloomed so many other ones. Um, you know, I remember working with Doug Scott and saying, geez, it would be great if we could do some ballistics research on, on the muskets. And we did that and are still working on that project. You know, we've been working on it for four years now. Um, you know, there's many other projects that have started up based upon this one. Um, we just finished last year or started a wonderful project at Saratoga with veterans. Um, you know, it's just so much has come out of this. Yeah. And I, I, what came out of it for me, one of the things is I had my own company. So I was a, I was an independent contractor when the Friends of the Minuteman Park hired me. Um, but even before I handed in the final report, I actually took a position as an archaeologist with the Northeast Region Archaeology Program. So I was able to transition. They had, fortunately, they had a position open that I was able to apply for. And I transitioned into that program and was able to bring, you know, the whole experience with partnerships and with mm. volunteers and methodology with me, but also the folks in our, in, in my current office now, like, um, uh, Joel Dukes and Bill Griswold, they already have experience and they were, they were involved in this project as well. So it's all kind of merged together. And now when we're doing work, we have a, a group of very, very kind of expert archeology, especially material, um, specialists in some of our volunteers from the Parker's Revenge Project. And we really benefit 
from not only having them in the field with us, helping us and helping us train other people, but also having them in the lab with us, mm. with the artifacts, you know, that we pulled, right, Joel, that we that we right. have from yep. Saratoga that Bill and uh, Joel Dukes, you know, we're, we're managing that project. And we've had Joel come up and, and have have look at things in the lab and building our partnerships kind of and, and friendships keep evolving. Um, as, as Joel said, we worked with a group called AVAR, um, which is American veterans uh, in archaeology. They, they bring veterans into the field to work with archaeology. What better than to go to, you know, Saratoga, the Barber Wheatfield, you know, Revolutionary War battle, and then in having them involved in the whole process has then opened our, our eyes you know, to a whole different way of perceiving um, of the history um, and, and what was happening uh, in the field and in the lab as well. So it's, Parker's Revenge was kind of a platform to, to continue to develop our approach to battlefields, to archeology span and our kind of embracing volunteers and, and working carefully because we are in very special places, um, but you know, doing, doing some really exciting work. Absolutely. And, and, you know, of course, you know, well, well, you know, it was, it was a great day when I learned that you had, you know, become, you know, part of the, the, the National Park Service um, in your position. And, you know, and our volunteers too, they are also part of the National Park Service. You know, mm -hmm. Joel is as much a part of Minuteman National Historical Park as those of us who wear the uniform. Yeah. Um, and Joel, you did not put your metal detector down after this project. Uh, uh, you, you continued on with it with uh, uh, the uh, AMDA. Oh. You're, you're back on, you were a little frozen. Am I here now? Yes, you're you here are. now, we can you're hear you're you. Back. Okay. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that, for some reason I keep getting bumped. Um, yeah, um, I think Doug suggested and Dr. Sheldon Skaggs worked with us also mm -hmm. um, that we take a training called AMDA, Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologist. Um, and so I took first one right after we finished the uh, first week of the project. And then I ended up taking five or six or seven more um, as we went <laughs> along, along with some uh, National Park Service, uh, National Center for Preservating, Preservation Technology and Training um, yeah. courses, and then became an instructor at AMDA, and now I'm a member of the uh, board. So it's... Great. it's <laughs> Yeah. Another thing came out of his revenge. So. Excellent. Well, thank Jim, you both. Yes. Can I ask you? I want to interrupt. Can I ask you, Jim? What was your takeaway? How did how did you personally and the park, you know, um, benefit from that project? Well, you know, in terms of the battle road, it, it's not a, a a very well documented battle. Um, you know. Colonial accounts can be a little bit more site specific. They'd say things like Miriam Hill or Tanner Brook. Um, but a lot of the British accounts are, you know, this one long, you know, uh, bloody day of being shot at. So, you know, they'll know key features like Concord, they'll know Lexington Center. Um, so it's really hard to place uh, any particular action in one location. Even if you have theories, if the primary accounts match up to what the landscape seems to be or what it looks like now, uh, you can come up with, with your, your theories about, you know, or interpretations of those sources and try to tie them to landscape. But for Parker's Revenge now, because of this work, it's the really, you know, the one spot or one of the few spots on the battlefield. Uh, actually, no, I'll say it is the one spot on the battlefield where we can say, we know this happened here. And not only do we know it happened here, we know how it happened um, because of the evidence that was collected during the investigation and the analysis, the very deep analysis um, of that evidence. And, you know, and it's what we call place-based interpretation. It's so much more powerful, you know, when you can say it happened here, like, you know, having that moment out there in the woods, you know, where Joel, you're showing me, and I go, oh, you know, this makes sense. And, and our visitors, whenever I take visitors out to that site, I want to, I want them to have that moment mm. of standing out there and going, I understand, I get it now. You know, it's like the place really does speak to you and it teaches you um, not only about the past or about events of the past, but about the people, um, you know, who, who took part in it. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll keep it going and just keep learning. I think, you know, and also a big, 
key is to always ask the question. And, uh, yeah. you know, so it looks like we just, oh, there he is. Um, oh. So, you know, always ask the question, keep asking questions, and, and together we learn. So I thank you all very much for uh, joining me today and, um, you know, and being a part of our virtual Patriots Day experience. Uh, these are strange days, but, uh, you know, hopefully we'll uh, be able to teach people um, something about April 19th, 1775, perhaps something that folks didn't know before and inspire them to get more involved and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, moving forward. So thank you all and, uh, and happy Patriots Day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Meg. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jim. Bye-bye.